Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. We are so, so close to 50,000 subscribers. By the way, thank you so much for that. I am continually blown away by your support, and I think we could possibly get there by the end of the month. If you could hit the like button and comment down below, that would be appreciated as engagement helps to get my content distributed further on YouTube. And of course, if you're new here, please subscribe and stick around and hit the little bell icon so you never miss an upload because I'm bad at keeping a schedule. Today, we're discussing three mysterious disappearances. Let's get into it. Number 1. Hannah Up September 2017 had been a vicious hurricane season for the Caribbean. The island of St. Thomas in the United States Virgin Islands was battered from Hurricane Irma when word got out that there would be a second hurricane approaching. With days to prepare, residents of the small island began to either evacuate the island or bunker down. One of the residents who chose to stay was 32-year-old Hannah Up. Hannah taught at the island's Montessori school and was described as vibrant, energetic, fearless, and adventurous, but the stress from the hurricane seemed to be taking a toll. While she was preparing her classroom for the second storm, her co-workers noticed she was off. Her positive, bubbly demeanor was muted. She was described as acting complacent and quiet, which was very unusual for her. Though at the time, it was easy to brush that off as just stress from the storm. On September 14th, Hannah's roommate saw her get up and leave the house around 8 a.m. Though it was earlier than she usually left the house, her roommate assumed that she was going to work early to help out the school. This would end up being the last confirmed sighting of Hannah. The following day, Hannah missed a meeting at the school, and her co-worker and best friend Maggie Guzman thought that this was highly unusual. She tried to call her, but no answer, and had stopped by Hannah's house and noticed her car wasn't in the driveway. Becoming increasingly concerned, Maggie started contacting Hannah's friends and family. One of Hannah's oldest friends cryptically told her to look by water. Maggie started a search party and asked people to start looking in Hannah's favorite spots. One beach in particular, Sapphire Beach, was Hannah's favorite place to swim. The beach was a disaster. Hurricane Irma had turned the pristine beach into a wrecking yard of debris. The beach was deserted, but there, in the parking lot, was Hannah's car. Inside the vehicle were her purse, passport, ID, and hundreds of dollars in cash. On a bar stool in what used to be a beach hut bar was a pile of neatly folded clothing, sandals, and car keys, all belonging to Hannah. At that point, Hannah had already been missing for two days when the official search for her began. It was believed that she'd gone for a swim and something may have happened to her. Because ferries and local boaters were helping to evacuate the island, there was heavy boat traffic that day. The entire parameter of the island was searched, with no sign of Hannah anywhere. During the search, it was discovered that this wasn't the first time that Hannah had gone missing. This would be the third time, and the previous two incidents also had happened under similar circumstances. Back in September 2008, the then 23-year-old Hannah said goodbye to her roommate. It had been the first day of her new teaching job in New York City. Again, she failed to show up for work, which immediately launched a missing person investigation. The NYPD had treated the case from the start as an abduction, as Hannah had disappeared without her wallet, ID, and left cash in her apartment. She vanished without a trace. Nine days into her disappearance, NYPD received a call from a man who'd gone to school with Hannah, and he said that he'd seen her at an Apple store. He said that he'd gone up to her and asked her if she was the Hannah that was missing, and bizarrely, she said that she wasn't Hannah, nor was she missing. This confused the man as he was sure he was talking to Hannah, and she was very much missing. The NYPD got surveillance footage from the store, and they were able to confirm it was Hannah Up. 
Why had she told the man she wasn't Hannah? Seems that there's a moment in time and then she's just not, just not there. Police say she was positively identified in Manhattan's Midtown area shortly after 9 a.m. Tuesday morning. Local media reports she was seen checking her email at an Apple store. The New York City Police Department is still seeking the public's assistance in locating up. Anyone with any information is asked to contact Crime Stoppers. Authorities say all information will be kept strictly confidential. The NYPD determined that Hannah had been to the Apple Store to log into her Gmail account and confirmed that she was alive. But it started more questions than answers. What was she doing? Why was she hiding? Why had she seemingly abandoned her life? Two weeks into her disappearance, it was discovered that she had been using the facilities of her old gym to shower. Though she had no ID on her, she remembered her gym number and a front desk person was able to confirm her identity. She'd also been sighted at a Starbucks in Soho, but she had disappeared again by the time officers had arrived. On the 20th day since she'd first gone missing, the ferry captain of Staten Island Ferry saw a woman's head bobbing in the water, floating face down. They deployed a rescue boat and assumed the young woman was dead and were shocked when she gasped for air and started crying as they lifted her out of the water. She was taken to the hospital, severely dehydrated, hypothermic, and covered in sunburns, but otherwise okay. She wasn't able to tell medical staff who she was or what had happened to her. At the hospital, she was diagnosed with a rare form of amnesia called disassociative fugue. Usually only brought on by extreme psychological trauma, it is the same form of amnesia that was portrayed in the Jason Bourne story. Sufferers often appear very typical. Though they may not be able to tell people who they are, they can continue on everyday activities that they may have done routinely in the past, like show up at your old gym or go to places that are most familiar to them. What had happened to Hannah that brought on this state? Eventually, Hannah could remember her first name and gave medical staff her mother's phone number. Her mother arrived less than an hour later and the first thing Hannah said was, Why am I wet? She had no memory of the past three weeks and the last thing she remembered was going for a run the day she went missing. She was embarrassed by the news coverage and had even considered changing her name to get away from the publicity. A year after the incident in New York, she left. She eventually landed in Maryland, where she became a teaching assistant at a Montessori school for underserved children. She loved the theology behind Montessori and enjoyed her work there. She went all in, 100% into her work. It was a September morning in 2011 when Hannah's mother got a call from the police. Hannah had once again been reported missing, and like before, her purse, cell phone, and wallet had all been located, but this time on a footpath on walking trail. When her purse had been found, the last time anyone had seen her was the day before. Another search was undertaken, and it was close to midnight when her mother received a call from an unknown number. The voice on the other end only said, Mom? Hannah had again been in a fugue state, but she had come out of it by herself, and when she came to, she realized she was sitting in a creek with a shopping cart next to her. Once again, she had no idea how she got there or how much time had passed this time. She'd been able to navigate herself out of the woods and found some commercial buildings where she was able to borrow a stranger's phone. All three disappearances had happened in September, right before a new school year began. In the days following up to her 2017 disappearance, friends had noticed she had been acting odd. She had told one friend that she didn't like the fall. None of her friends in St. Thomas knew about her past disappearances. Her family had been nervous for her to move so far away, but Hannah had laughed and said, It's a small island, how far can I go? Six days before her disappearance, she stopped using her phone. She seemed to be on autopilot, but because those closest to her had no idea about her past, they brushed it off as stress from the storms. She could have already been transitioning into a fugue state for several days before it eventually took over. Hannah was a strong swimmer, and for some reason, she was drawn to the water when she was in a fugue state. She had mentioned after her 2011 disappearance that water helped her to find herself. Back on St. Thomas, crews searched desperately for two days before the search had to be called off because Hurricane Maria was touching down. Even worse than Irma, Maria brought on heavy winds and rain and once again battering St. Thomas. 
After the hurricane passed, the search was taken up again by boat and helicopter. All 80 islands in the area were searched with no sign of Hannah. Other theories that were run down were that she may have swum to one of the other islands or been picked up by a local boater. The days leading up to Hurricane Maria were a flurry of activity and it could have been possible that she'd been lost in the shuffle. Her disappearance in New York demonstrated that she was very resourceful and could draw from previous knowledge to keep her safe. Her mother routinely visits St. Thomas and everyone on the island knows what Hannah looks like. Her mother remains optimistic that one day Hannah will pop up somewhere and remember who she is. Do you think you'll ever know for sure, Barbara, what happened? I can only tell you that that hope is persistent and many people join me in that hope. Number two. Elaine Park. On January 27, 2017, Elaine Park got in her car and disappeared in the early morning hours. The 20-year-old had spent the night at her on-and-off boyfriend's house in Calabasas, Los Angeles, California. Her boyfriend, Div Compare, said the two had seen a movie the night before, and when they went to bed, everything seemed normal. However, around 4 a.m., Elaine seemed to have woken up abruptly and was experiencing a panic attack. She told him she wanted to leave, and she did, around 6 a.m. Div was the son of a wealthy businessman and lived with his parents in a high-end, gated community. She was seen leaving in her car by security cameras at the house, as well as a license plate scanner on her way out of the gated community. This was the last confirmed sighting of Elaine. Elaine Park had been born on September 24, 1996, and she grew up in La Crescenta, California, a small community outside of L.A., the community was described as tight-knit and everyone-knows-everyone kind of community. Elaine was an incredibly artistic person. She had a sweet and bubbly personality that drew people to her. Elaine was on the cheerleading team in high school and she was active in her school's theater program. She loved acting, singing, dance, poetry, and had dreams of breaking into Hollywood as an actress. She'd already had a few minor roles under her belt in ER, Desperate Housewives, and Crazy Stupid Love. Elaine was coming off of a rough year. She had recently dropped out of college, was laid off from her job, and had struggled to cope with her parents' divorce. She was living with her mom Susan in La Crescenta, and her mother had seen her the day before her disappearance. She said that Elaine had asked to borrow 20 bucks and told her that she was going out with Div. Her mother gave her the money and Elaine left. It was about an hour's drive from La Crescenta to Calabasas, and she arrived around 7 p.m. Elaine texted her mom when she arrived and told her that she would be going to the movies. The two spent a few hours hanging out, and at 10.30 p.m., they took an Uber to the movie theater in Calabasas Commons. They returned via Uber at around 1 a.m., which was confirmed with security footage, and they went to bed shortly after. Div said that it was around 4 a.m. when Elaine started acting erratically. He said that she was shaking and singing and... He said that to him, she seemed to be having a panic attack. He said that he tried to get her to stay, but she wanted to leave and he didn't stop her. She was picked up leaving on the security cameras and her body language doesn't indicate any sign of stress, agitation, or fear. Later that day, her mother sent her a text message, but initially she wasn't alarmed when she didn't get a response from her daughter. She also wasn't concerned when Elaine didn't come home that night, as she had assumed she was still with Div. Elaine was in her 20s and wasn't in the habit of telling her mom where she was all the time. January 30th, she tried to call Elaine several times and throughout the day and noticed that some of the calls went straight to voicemail, while other times it would ring once or twice before going to voicemail. It was very unlike Elaine to not respond to calls, and it was at this point that Susan contacted Glendale Police Department to file a missing person report. Elaine was also very active on social media, and her social media activity was completely halted on January 27th. It was a huge red flag for Elaine's friends and family, who now were increasingly concerned about the whereabouts of Elaine. The first time Susan called to file a report, she had been told to wait a couple days, and she had to call back again on January 31st to get a missing person report filed and start an investigation. There was now a four-day window from the last time she had seen her daughter. The investigation began and the Uber drivers were interviewed, and neither noticed anything unusual with Elaine or Div. They said that the couple seemed happy, were having a good time, and nothing stood out. 
Her family said that Elaine had never suffered from panic attacks in the past and thought it was unusual that she would suddenly have one the night she disappeared. There were questions about drug use, though Div denied that they had used any substances. Friends of Elaine said that she had been known to experiment in the past, but wasn't a frequent drug user. Police said that Div cooperated fully with officers and he wasn't considered a suspect. Police focused on using her cell phone ping to locate her, and on February 5th, her phone pinged off of a cell tower in Malibu. Nine days after her disappearance, officers located her gray 2015 Honda Civic. It was found seemingly abandoned along the Pacific Coast Highway. It was a heavily populated area with houses and businesses all along the beach. Her car was found unlocked, keys in the ignition with the lights on and a dead battery. All of her belongings were laid out inside the car, which included her laptop, cell phone, and money. It was unclear why it was in Malibu. It wasn't an area of LA that Elaine frequented. Except for the battery, the car was fine. There was also no sign of struggle in the vehicle forensically. Bloodhounds were brought in and they didn't pick up her scent in the area, and cadaver dogs also went through the car and they didn't indicate to anything suspicious. It also didn't seem likely that her car had been there long. Residents in the area said they would have noticed a car not moving for several days with the lights on. Also, because the car had been found unlocked with the keys in the ignition, it led officers to believe that the car had been dumped and maybe someone had intended to have the car stolen. Detectives searched the coastal area near the car for two weeks and found nothing else related to Elaine's disappearance. Officers didn't release how much cash was found in Elaine's car, but Elaine's mother noted it was more than the $20 she had given her. Her family says that they don't think that Elaine left willingly and she didn't have the means to run away and start a new life. The Glendale Police Department made a huge mistake, which may have undermined the entire investigation. They returned the vehicle and all of the personal items found in the car to Elaine's family without taking fingerprints or DNA samples from any of the items. Though they told media that they felt that the disappearance was suspicious and likely foul play. The Parks family hired their own private detective, but he wasn't able to locate any new information that led to finding Elaine. Police are asking anyone from Calabasas and Malibu to check their security or dash cams from January 28, 2017 to February 2, 2017. Elaine was last seen wearing a light gray sweatshirt, denim shorts, and a white athletic shoes. She also has waist-length brown hair with blonde tips. She is of Korean descent, standing at 5'5 five five and very petite. She has four distinct tattoos. On her left arm, she has a moth on her forearm and a cow skull on her upper arm. On her right arm, she has a dagger and a rose on her left shoulder. She also might be wearing a gold necklace with the letter E. It was her favorite necklace and it wasn't found with her belongings. If you have any information, please contact the number on this poster. Number three, Kleshendra Hall. In early May 1994, in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 18-year-old Cleshandra Hall was dropped off at her clerical job by her mother. She was most often called Clea and worked for Dr. Larry Amos, who ran a nonprofit organization out of his house. The teen was close to graduating high school and she only had two weeks left, and then she had plans of becoming a pediatrician. She had a summer internship lined up in Boston and was registered to start pre-med classes in the fall at Tennessee State University. Clea worked evenings and weekends and typically called one of her parents to pick her up when she was finished. Clea called at 8 p.m. and her mother answered. Clea asked if anyone had called the house for her and no one had, so Clea said she was almost finished and she would call again for her ride. Her mother hung up and waited for that call but ended up dozing off on the couch. The phone never rang again and her mother, Laurel, woke up with a start at 12.45 a.m. when her husband came home from work. Laurel immediately called Dr. Amos, and she said that he answered on the first ring. He noted that Clea had left at 8.30 p.m. and got into a vehicle he didn't recognize. At first, her mother assumed that she might have called up a friend and went somewhere with them. She stayed up all night waiting, but Clea never walked through the door. Her family had hoped that she would be at school the following day, but deep down, her mother knew that something wasn't right. Clea never took off. She was an incredibly responsible teenager. She was an honor student, top of her class, and was given the commencement speech at her graduation ceremony in two weeks. 
She worked hard to save her college and was active in her church and multiple academic clubs. She never went anywhere without telling anyone. Clea also didn't have her purse or any ID. None of her belongings were missing. There was no way she had planned on leaving for an extended amount of time. Clea's brother called home from school the following morning and let his parents know that she wasn't there, and they called the police to report her missing. Unfortunately, like so many of these cases, police told Clea's mother to wait 24 hours and hold tight in case she came back. When the allotted 24 hours passed, an official police report was filed, but it contained very little information and a search was not started immediately. Clea's parents organized their own search party with the community members, and after a few days, law enforcement got involved. Clea's parents were upset that the Pine Bluff Police Department didn't take Clea's disappearance seriously right from the beginning. No evidence was found in the search, it was as if she had just vanished. A person of interest was her employer, Dr. Larry Amos. He had been the last to see her alive, and he had left the state the following morning after her disappearance. He also wasn't cooperative with the police, and he wouldn't allow officers to search the home for evidence. When asked to take a polygraph test, he also refused. However, Clea had worked for Dr. Amos for over a year and had never expressed any concerns over her safety, felt he was aggressive or off, and she enjoyed her job and there had never been any complaints. Clea had a boy that she'd been interested in dating and he was also considered a person of interest. He fully cooperated with police and had his vehicle searched, which yielded no evidence of Clea. He also took a polygraph test and was cleared as a suspect. 18 years later, in 2012, two construction workers came forward with new statements. One said that he'd been hired to work on the home of Dr. Amos in the late 90s. While he'd been working, he noticed some of the insulation was stained with what looked to him to be blood. The other worker had been hired to do some landscaping, and he said that when the wind blew a particular direction, he would smell a horrible odor, unlike anything he had ever smelled before. It is unclear why the men had waited so long to come forward to the police, but it was enough to get a court order to access the house for the first time. Police brought in cadaver dogs, took drywall and insulation samples, and searched the property. The search sparked a hope that there would be answers or justice for Clea. However, something happened during the police search. Four bags of evidence were removed from the home and an officer was charged with maintaining chain of custody. He had been expected to bring the evidence straight to the forensic lab. However, for some reason, he went home with the evidence and decided to leave it in his trunk overnight. This led to all four bags of evidence being dismissed as the chain of custody had been broken, and the integrity of the evidence had been compromised. The officers involved were reprimanded, and it was a crushing blow to the investigation. They couldn't go back, and without any new evidence, the case went cold. Police now believe that Clea was a victim of foul play, and tragically, her mother agrees. Laura Hall said that she is certain Clea was murdered. Clea has been missing for 27 years with no new leads since 2012. I stopped looking, or we stopped looking, or we stopped put, letting go of our balloons. Who's going to help me find out what happened to my child? A child with big dreams whose mysterious disappearance haunts an Arkansas community. Well, that is it for this video. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content and subscribe for more if you haven't already. If you've done all that and want to support me in the channel, we have channel membership and Patreon to get early access, members-only content, and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box and links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.